Hello, everyone. It's Friday night, which means time to, again to talk about the world of healthcare around us, as well as the people who are out there making a difference and paving us a new future. Just a reminder, again, that the views here expressed are entirely our own. So the past few weeks, I've done some country-specific snapshots just to give everyone a sense of what's going on in different parts of the world, reacting to the current pandemic situation and the plans for the future. But I think equally important in this docu-series is to talk about the borderless ideas. And so today we're going to challenge ourselves in terms of thinking about population health versus personalized health. And with that, I'm very privileged to welcome Professor Dean Ho to the program. Dean studied biomedical engineering at UCLA, where he was a professor. Currently, he's a provost chair professor at National University Singapore. He's also the head of the N of One program that we'll talk about, the Institute of Digital Medicine, and he's got many other accolades, such as being awarded into the National Academy of Inventors and the Generation T program. So with that, Dean, thanks a lot for joining. Thanks for having me. And yes, I've obviously said some things about you, but please feel free to give a bit of a, a detailed introduction about yourself and, and what you're into. Sure. So um, I currently uh, direct the N1 Institute for Health. And N1 is a clinical stage institute where we use various AI and digital medicine platforms to individualize the treatment of every patient that gets recruited into one of our trials. Um, the second institute that I direct is the Institute for Digital Medicine. And with that uh, program, we are also clinical stage and we expand beyond N of one care to uh, look at digital therapeutics um, and other digital medicine platforms, uh, both inside the oncology space, as well as expanded out to other areas like infectious diseases, transplant medicine, uh, you know, cognitive health, uh, so on and so forth. I'm also the head of biomedical engineering here. And that's exciting because um, I get to work with a team of very talented faculty members um, that span various areas that also include robotics, biomaterials, drug delivery, et cetera. So I really get to experience this full spectrum of research innovation as well as education. Great, thanks. And we'll come back into N of One in a minute and how you've been dealing with the COVID situation. But just before that, given kind of your view of the world, what do you think of the current COVID matters and the, and the pandemic? What's your, what's your take so far? So with regards to the current pandemic, the bulk of the area that I work on is in therapeutics. And I think that, you know, we, we, if we look at the past few months, um, a lot of important work has been done to try to figure out um, which drugs could be useful uh, to address uh, infection. And I think this kind of sheds a light upon this continued need to think beyond traditional drug screening and drug repurposing. Right? When something like this happens where we just don't have enough time uh, to think about developing a new therapy, uh, the, the go-to strategy is repurposing because we have therapies that are approved for other indications. We have some investigational therapies that could have promise. And the typical strategy is to go and look at their mechanism, mechanisms of action, combine them, uh, use clinical dosing, and see if these drugs work. Um, but I think that under this urgency, um, you know, time matters, right? We need to, you know, treat as many patients that we can, prevent the spread of disease via diagnostics. Um, and so when a lot of these trials start up during this period of time, um, it's important to have more actionable information uh, in terms of which drugs may or may not uh, work better quickly. Um, and so a lot of our work focuses on this area. And I think, again, with the, with the upshoot or the emergence of this pandemic, um, it has really shed a light on some key needs, especially in drug development, where, you know, I think we can move beyond, beyond repurposing drugs. I think we need to think beyond the methodologies used to advance drugs forward, because um, I, I do think with the help of newer approaches, uh, we can arrive at the right answer faster. So let's dig into this a bit more. Maybe you can just explain how N of One works. What is the focus area and how in this current climate are you basically redefining the way healthcare is going to work for our society? 
Sure. So, uh, you know, uh, before the, the pandemic started, uh, you know, N1 and Wisdom, we, we were doing a lot of individualized care um, where we have cancer patients uh, and their clinicians approaching us. We design studies specifically for these patients, be it uh, dynamically dosing uh, drug regimens specifically for the patient or getting multiple patients recruited into a cohort, but then individualizing each of their regimens. When the pandemic started up, we initiated a, a program in-house, um, N1 ID, Wisdom ID, basically uh, harnessing our platform to develop population-optimized strategies as well for things like uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and so um, we, we worked with a team of uh, you know, amazing um, technologists as well as those in policy, um, healthcare economics, such as yourself, uh, you were part of our team as well. Um, global health security and surveillance experts, field epidemiologists, to better understand how we could leverage some of our AI and digital medicine platforms uh, to address challenges like COVID-19. I will say that between all of our institutes, um, uh, be it N1 or Wisdom, we strongly believe that technology alone is not enough to transform healthcare. I think there's this minimum threshold. We have to show that the technologies are robust, that they are validated, that they are versatile, um, that they can be validated across many different indications. But once that's done, I think we need to leverage a much larger community to bring these technologies uh, towards uh, practice changing medicine. Um, and so through work with your team and others, you know, I think we've established that it's important, especially in times like this, to uh, come up with actionable answers rapidly um, and with, uh, you know, atta attainable resources, if you will. Um, economies are overburdened, uh, hospital systems overburdened, research operations are impacted by how work is being impacted, right? And so I think the beauty of one of our platforms that we call Identify, uh, which is using AI to optimize combination therapy for infectious diseases, we've shown that we can deploy it very quickly. We've shown that we can interrogate massive uh, parameter spaces um, in terms of picking the best drugs and the best doses. And we can do it within, you know, a few days to a two, in, in, towards two weeks, right? And the, the interesting thing is our platform, we have uh, substantial evidence that what we pinpoint from in vitro or preclinical findings translate very well to clinical. And we have a track record of that. And so, um, you know, with Identify, I think we've addressed a very critical challenge that's often overlooked in drug development or in finding proper regimens. To do this, you have to pinpoint, especially from large drug sets, right? Even from a set of 12 drugs, 12 is not a big number, all right? If we take these 12 drugs and we want to find the best combination possible from these 12 drugs, and we don't really know where the boundaries are on what type of combos we can try at which dosages, 12 drugs, try them each at 10 dosages, that's a trillion possible combinations, all right? If we take standard screening and we take drug number one of 12 and we apply it to say the coronavirus and this drug doesn't work, traditional screening kicks that drug out from contention, uh, but we leave it in. We leave it in because even though drug one's not useful on its own, maybe drug one combined with drug eight, combined with drug 11, at the right dosage will leverage unexpected or unpredictable drug interactions. And it will be, drug one will in fact be required to optimize therapeutic outcomes. That's why this parameter space is huge. And since, so instead of picking two or three drugs that we think might be useful, let's go with 12. It's a parameter space of a trillion possible combinations. Give us about two weeks we will simultaneously find the right drugs and dosages to optimize treatment. I think that's probably one of the most active efforts we've been doing over the past several weeks. Always impressive to hear that. And, and like I said at the beginning and you alluded to, I mean, what we're doing here is we're redefining the way healthcare can work. And so hopefully this is something that can scale 
And, and I know that you've redeployed the technology from oncology now to looking at infectious disease. I'll put a link in this video at the bottom to the paper that, that uh, we had written uh, on the topic. But sure. yeah, what, what have been your learning so far related to how this technology is applied to infectious disease? Um, and you know, if you want to go into more detail about that, how the technology works, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Sure, so in terms of what we learned over the past couple of months, especially over the past few weeks is that uh, we, we, we need to engage many stakeholders as we initiate uh, each run um, or each process of running identify. Um, we started out with 12 drugs um, and these drugs included, you know, remdesivir, which is being widely studied, um, you know, lopinavir, ritonavir, which is an HIV combo and other drugs. Um, and we, we partnered with a, uh, a clinician uh, in the infectious disease space to help us vet these drugs out before we initiate Identify. And, you know, the important thing about Identify is that we don't use pre-existing clinical data to train any sort of algorithm. And the reason for that is, you know, we're talking about 12 drugs, right? In order to really properly interrogate the drug and dose parameter space, we need to test out different drugs in combination at different dosages to set those boundaries. And in order to do that, a lot of that data doesn't exist uh, from prior clinical trials, right? And so we actually, in lieu of using pre-existing training data, we run actual experiments prospectively um, to effectively define that space. And in order to do that, we want to make sure we're starting with the right drugs so that we don't finish out a whole experiment, start ranking combinations out from our data only to speak to a clinician to find out that they wouldn't actually comfortably give these combinations to patients. And so engaging stakeholders is critical. Um, you know, we've spoken to healthcare economists about scaling our platform, right? Can we prove that we can deploy this quickly? what are the metrics we need to set for ourselves? Are we going to try and get people out of the ICU faster? How can we establish this platform in a way that it's cost neutral, that it's actually implementable? And I'll say that Identify was developed and meant to uh, be deployed uh, as a public benefit, if you will, as a public service. Um, you know, we're not commercializing Identify. Um, it, it's, our, it's our kind of platform to help not only address COVID-19, but to be prepared for what happens next. If something else pops up a year later, two years later, we'll have answers quickly. Um, you know, very basically, you know, what's important about, um, if I were to sum up the difference between how Identify works versus traditional drug development. Um, when thinking about combination therapies, uh, we often use mechanism of action. Right? We think, hey, drug one does this, drug two does this, let's add them together and, and go. And then let's apply it to the disease model. Could be in vitro, could be an animal, it could be human. And let's see if it works, right? Identify is different because we take this larger pool of drugs and, and we try different dosages and we basically give different iterations of combinations and dosages to different populations of the same virus. So we are effectively crowdsourcing the virus to tell us which iterations are the best, right? And, and in doing that, we actually don't know what the best combinations are, ranked from best to worst. We don't know that until the experiment is done, right? We don't go in with any preconceived notions of what the combos will be or even the dosing. We range it all out. And so the only real um, kind of preconceived notions going in is which drugs we start with, which we work with clinicians on. After that, Identify will run those experiments out, actual experiments to tell us at the very end uh, what the viruses, if you will, told us was the best intervention. So it's a very much optimized first, then you know, look at why that happened versus standard approaches, which is let's go in and interrogate the mechanism to find a better outcome. We skip straight to optimization. And uh, if I could sort of oversimplify, in a way, what we're talking about here is going from a population health blockbuster model to a highly personalized, even down to the individual on different days of the week, how their body is going to react to certain, uh, certain medications. So, you know, 
where, what are the broader applications of a concept like this? You've already worked in cancer and, and infectious disease now, but yeah, what is the kind of broader, you know, cross-border, wider population aspect to this here? Sure. In terms of expanding this out to the population, you know, it, uh, a lot of the combinations, actually, when we do combination therapy design, right, Identify was built uh, to come up with population-wide actionable combination therapies. And so uh, our intent with what Identify arrives at is to give them actually at fixed dose, fixed dose uh, to the population. And very often, you know, combination therapies about finding which drugs to put together. What are the optimal configurations? Once we come up with that recipe, we can blanket that to the population and it does it quickly. Right. Um, and so our real uh, goal with Identify is to not necessarily individualize care, but to come up with population optimized or even subpopulation optimized regimens that are uh, fixed specifically for that group. Um, they, they probably won't be as efficacious as if we're able to take each patient and change each of their doses in time. But I would say that Identify and all of our other associated platforms, uh, they can find better configurations, which drugs go together uh, to leverage these unexpected interactions, right? And so I think starting with the right answer is critical, right? Why take two drugs and assume that they're the best if you add them together? Why not expand it out to a larger pool? Larger pool of drugs, larger pool of dosing capabilities. And one thing I will find out, well, I will mention is we only use clinically relevant dosing with our platforms. We don't ever go over maximum tolerated dosing. Actually, everything is clinically relevant. That's why it's actionable. Well, it's an exciting future out there. And again, it's just great to see how you can redeploy such a technology to help the current situation, but at the same time, redefine the way hope, hopefully healthcare is going to work into the future. So just last question here for you. What are your, what are your words of wisdom out there for everyone? Words of wisdom. You know, I think uh, science, engineering, innovation is very much a contact sport. Um, I think that, you know, when I said earlier on that technology alone cannot transform healthcare, I think it's very important for those in which whichever space they're working in to to, to not only just reach out and, and occasionally interact with uh, people from other disciplines, but really look for ways uh, in which this, this huge community of knowledge can, can be leveraged to uh, advance some of these innovations forward leaps and bounds. One, one quick example is um, our institutes work uh, with the business school um, at NUS, and we don't work with the business school for entrepreneurship. There are many outstanding and really, uh, really awesome programs here to do to, to implement entrepreneurship. But our collaborations look at things like, um, you know, decision architecture and, uh, you know, behavioral nudging um, and uh, in analytics to, to understand how we might be able to think about pricing some of our technologies down the road so that they're compatible with healthcare workflows around the world. And these are areas you know, we tend not to think about when we're technology heavy, right? We're working with uh, faculty members from communications to help us with our clinical trial recruitment campaigns. We need help from behavioral scientists. We need help from experts like yourself to understand, you know, again, what are some of the, what's the global landscape? What's the environment we're gonna be working in uh, to, to maximize the impact that our work can have from a non-technological side as well, right? How do you marry all these disciplines together? It's important, especially in a time like we're in right now, to, uh, to really reach out and uh, really learn about what we don't know enough about, right? And so um, I think that's a huge catalyst to, to really impacting healthcare. Wonderful. Well, and, and the 
people I've spoken to in the different countries, everyone has talked about how amazing it has been to see the different people coming and working together. I mean, building a hospital in 10 days. I mean, there's so many amazing examples of what we can all do collectively when we work together. So congratulations to you and the team and really just thanks for being a, a pioneer out there that's, that is helping to pave the future. So appreciate you joining, Dean. Thank you so much. <laughs> and with that, we'll sign off. We'll be back again next week with another episode, but please share your comments and feedback. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for all the positive uh, feedback so far. Good night, everyone.